Last week, or two weeks ago, when I was here, I was talking about uh, the, the attribute in your life of building a relationship with God. And I said there was a couple of really, really important things. There's, there's many things in the church, within church doctrine, uh, and everything is important in church doctrine, but some things are more important than other things for your life right now. Like, uh, and like one of the things, the doctrine of water baptism. Water baptism is a great thing to, to do and go through, but it's not a prerequisite for your salvation. It's not a prerequisite for your growth in God. It's a great thing to do. The Lord says to do it. When he says in, in Mark, go into all the world, or Matthew, end of Matthew and, and Mark, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But the thief on the cross, when Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, he wasn't water baptized. So sometimes something is a good thing to do, but some things are not so important. A couple of things I said that were really, really important for your growth in God. Number one, I talked about two weeks ago, was your relationship with the Father, your relationship with God. And you build, you come into salvation, and you don't even know Jesus, right? You know of him, and you, you are led to Jesus by the Holy Spirit, right? Because the Bible says none would have come. So God had uh, you, you earmarked. He sent the Holy Spirit to get you, and, uh, and he brought you to a place where the gospel was preached, and you heard the gospel preached, and you decided, uh, not actually you, but the Holy Spirit in you, got you to that place where you said yes to Jesus and it all began. And so from there, you started to uh, hopefully go to church and start to sit under the Word of God and, and start to pray, read the Word of God and start to build your relationship with a living God. He's not some statue. He's not some, some power. He's, he's God Almighty. He is a person of Jesus Christ. He is the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. He is the Trinity. And we need to come to know Him and build our relationship with Him. I talked about this two weeks ago. And so the other, one of the other most important things I said must happen uh, when you come to salvation is not just build a relationship with God, but the Word of God. The Word of God is, is so important to you as a growing Christian. Peter actually says that uh, you should desire the pure milk of the word so that you may grow. And many times I see Christians who have made a decision for Jesus and, and recognized what he'd done at Calvary's cross and, and paid the price for their sin and have said, ask Jesus to forgive them and come into their life and start that walk of, with God. And what happens is... The Word of God is missing from their life. The Word of God is missing from their life. And 20 years later, they're really no further down the track of their growth in their Christian life than they were in the first year that they received Christ. Why is that? You can always pinpoint that back to a lack of the Word of God and a lack of prayer. Prayer will build your relationship with God. Prayer uh, builds... Uh, it, all prayer is is communication. It's like when when you, you meet someone and you want to get married and you want to build a relationship with that person, it comes through communication, finding out what that person likes, finding out all about that person, finding out what makes them tick. You know, do they like flowers or not? You know, if they don't, don't bother wasting your money on them. You know, like, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, con it's a constant backwards and forwards communication with one another to build a relationship. And that's what prayer is for God. Prayer is not a monologue. We don't come to prayer and, and read out our shopping list and then say amen in Jesus' name and, and, and get going. No, we, we stop and we listen because God wants to speak to us more than we want to speak to him. And so when, when we stop and quieten ourselves and start to listen to the voice of God, what happens is we start to uh, hear him. Uh, whether, I don't know whether I've ever heard God audibly or not, 
Um, I thought I did once or twice, but I'm not sure. Um, but it's in our heart that we hear him and from the pages of this book. You know, I've lived in Australia now more than half of my life. I come from the UK. And um, when I first came to Australia, I didn't know Jesus. Um, I was drawn to Jesus here by a good friend that I met and uh, who told me about God and, and all the wonders of, of Jesus. And so, but one of the first things I had to do when I came to Australia, and if you've been here for 20 years, you've heard this story. Um, come on, I've only got so many stories. I'm not really that old yet. So when I first came, I, I, one of the first things you have to do is transfer your driving license. Uh, you can't drive on a British driving license for very long. If you're still driving on your old driving license from another country 10 years on, you're illegal, all right? So uh, I, I go to the driving centre. Uh, you are blessing. That was a smile on your face. <laughs> I, I went to the driving centre and I said, uh, I need to change my driving licence. And they said to me, OK, you need to do a test. And I said, but I can drive. <laughs> yeah, I've been driving for a while. And they said, we don't care. You've got to do a test. But you don't have to do the, the driving test. You've got to do the written test. And I said, OK, no problem. Give me the, give me the test. So they, gave me, they said, uh, go away. I said, can't I do it now? And they said, no. Uh, you have to go away and do the test and then come back. So reluctantly, arrogantly, I wasn't a Christian. Praise God. I took my papers, told the guy what I thought of him and went home. <laughs> and, uh, and when I went back, fortunately it was a different guy, and I handed my paperwork in and they marked it and they said, you failed. I was like, What? How can you fail a written driving test? I can understand if you fail a, the practical part of it. And he said, I could have almost guessed what, which questions you got wrong. And he actually said this. You won't be able to get away with this today. It was a long time ago. He said, you're a pom, aren't you? <laughs> and uh, I didn't, you know, play the race card or anything, you know, like, so I didn't go and say, I said, yeah. He said, you poms always get these ones wrong. He said, don't you know that in Australia, the road rules are different from the United Kingdom? I didn't know that. They drive on the same side of the road most days. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, did you read the manual? To which I said, what manual? <laughs> he said, the drive to stay alive manual. Anyone remember that drive to stay alive manual? You're the only one who's read it too? Thanks, <laughs> God. That's why, yeah, that's why we have problems on the road. And so I said, what manual? He said, the drive to stay alive manual. And he gave me the manual. He said, go read the manual and come back and do the test again. So I went home and I read the manual and it was like so bad. How can people drive according to this? And so I went back and I did the test again and I passed. What am I talking about, people of God? The manual. See, I'd come from a different country to a new country to start a new life and live a different way but I brought all my old ways with me yeah. and my old thinking and my old mindsets and we do this when we come to Jesus we come out of the world and we become Christians we recognize Christ but we don't read the manual and suddenly we're actually struggling to live this Christian life because we're trying to do it according to the old rules. And it doesn't work. The rules of God are not the same as the rules of this world. The ways of God, let me put it a better way, the ways of God are not the same as the ways of this world. 
And if we ever want to progress in our Christian walk and become stronger and get closer to God and start to function more in the way that God has called us to function, we need people of God to read the manual. That is, there's three things that I will sort of cover today quickly, but uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna keep you long. My wife said, "Don't always say that I'm not gonna keep you long because you always do." <laughs> And I don't like to lie from a pulpit, but uh, I know that many of you want to go out for lunch with your dads today. Some of you have got to go to the shops and buy some presents and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, so I'm going to give you time to do that. Total Tools is open till three o'clock. Okay? <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and so I want to talk a little bit about the Word of God. And there's three areas of the Word of God that we need to consider as Christians, because we're called believers, the first thing that must happen in our life, according to the Word of God, is that we believe it. That we believe it. You might say, oh, pastor, come on. We're all Christians here on a Sunday morning. What do you mean? You'll be surprised how many people are trying to follow Jesus that don't believe the book, that don't believe some of the things that are in the book. If the Bible says that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish, hey, guess what? He was swallowed by a big fish. You may not understand how. You may never have caught anything bigger than that. <laughs> but if you've ever swum past a, sh- a whale shark, you'll know how easy it is. Okay? Now, if the Bible says that there was three Hebrew teenagers put into a fiery furnace and they weren't burnt, guess what? It's the truth. You may not understand it, but you need to believe it. You need to believe it. There's many things in here that we read, and there's more that we read than we, than we just don't understand sometimes. Someone said to me the other week when I, some of the things I was saying, they said, the things you were saying are bringing up more questions And I said, well, if you study the Word of God and you don't have questions, you're not even reading the Word of God. Because I don't know about you, but I have new questions every day when I read this book. And that's just how it is. Because there's a reason why we don't always understand everything. I might get to that in a minute. So you've got to believe it. You've got to decide today, if I'm going to walk with God, I've got to believe this book. Now, you might go, yeah, but that's not really written in the original language. God is bigger than that. God is more than that. You know, the English language is not very good when it comes to uh, explaining some things. And that's why we not just read, but we need to study sometimes. What does this verse actually mean? And uh, we can actually let the Word, let the Word of God actually... Uh, explain the Word of God. The more you read, and some things, even like in life, you're not ready for yet. There's some things I'm reading, and I I might go and try to study, and I hear somebody, actually a teacher, explaining it or something, and I think, how did he get that? Do you ever do that? How did he get, how can he say all that from one little verse? Because he's further on, and they're learning more. And so we need, first of all, we need to make a decision. I'm going to believe it. And the second thing is, if you want to actually progress in the things of God, you not only got to believe it, but now it gets difficult. Believing it's easy. Now you've got to agree with it. Okay, there's lots of things. See, when I read the Drive to Stay Alive book, I believed that this was now the rules on the road in Australia. Did I agree with it? No, I still don't. <laughs> I still think the speed limit is crazy on a dual carriageway at 50 kilometers an hour. Or so. It's just like, I could walk faster. <laughs> Do it, but we need to agree with it. We need to agree with the book. See, there's, there's a principle in the Bible that talks about the power of agreement. And when we can actually not only believe it, but agree with it, God, you said it, so it must be. You said it, so I believe it. And not only do I believe it, 
but I agree with it even though I don't understand it. Because the Bible didn't say uh, to understand it. He says get understanding. He didn't tell you just to, to wipe it out. I don't understand that, so I'm not going to bother with it. He tells you to get understanding and get knowledge. But thank God for Proverbs 3, 5. Because that's my, ver- my go-to verse. And it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on what? Your own understanding. Because my understanding is flawed. My mind is fallen. I live, my body, you might not tell at the moment, is in a fallen state. <laughs> and my flesh is part of this fallen world. And my mind and, and the area of my soul is, is not totally transformed yet. And this is why Paul says in in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, not to be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the renewing of your mind comes, and you can read it in Ephesians chapter 5, I think verse 26 or 27, it says that it's by the washing of water by the word of God. So if we don't have the Word of God, how can we expect to be washed by that? How can we expect to have our minds renewed if I had to have my mind renewed to the road rules of Australia? I had to believe it. I still believe the road rules because if I don't stick to it, guess what? Someone writes me a ticket. But then you've got to say, okay, so I don't understand it, Lord, but I believe it and I agree with it. And I agree with it. I agree with your word. This is the word of God. This is not the word of the pastor of the church. This is the word of God who cannot lie. Right? It's not that he doesn't lie. He cannot lie. He said, I am not a man that I should lie, nor the son of man that I should repent. God is truth. And his word is truth. We'll, have a, we'll look at some scriptures in a minute. Turn with me to Colossians. Oh, I've been in Colossians for a couple of weeks now. <coughs> Excuse me. After our relationship is, with God is restored, we build that relationship and we build it through prayer, communication with God, and by the word of God. Amen. The answer to everything that we need is in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. Now, you may not have found it yet. You may go, well, I've got a question I haven't found the answer to. Have you read it all? Have you studied it all? No, because what, sometimes what you read five years ago, people of God, may mean something totally different to you today because the Bible hasn't changed, but you have. Amen? And sometimes we can't grow too fast. We've got to learn some new things. Uh, Every page of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, some people today have thrown their Old Testament away because they say, we live under a new covenant. Well, if you don't know your Old Testament, you don't know why there's a New Testament. (laughs) Amen? And if you don't know the New Testament, you're stuck in the Old Testament, you're in more trouble than you thought you were. So we need the whole Bible. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for us. Now here, you'll find in Colossians chapter 3, sorry, there's a little passage between verse 12 and 17. And in my Bible, that passage is titled, Character of the New Man. Character of the New Man. This is your born-again man. Okay, so you started a new life in Christ. And there's a character, and and the Bible says there's a few things in there. Go home and read this this afternoon for your homework and bring your, I'll test you next week. And, uh, And it says, therefore, as the elect of God, and that's what you are, you've been elected by God. You are the elect of God. And beloved, holy, he says, put on, put on. 
Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering, bearing with one another. These are the things you're supposed to put on as you grow in God. Now you're a new man. Bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Then he says, but above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. See, even the Bible says bonds are perfection. <laughs> no wonder my wife wanted my name. And, and let the, verse 15, and let the, at least you're laughing. And verse 15 says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, for which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Listen to this, verse 16. This is what I want. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to God. I didn't think, like when I came to church this morning, I'd, I'd, I'd had a cold this week and then you think, you're not supposed to go anywhere if you're ill, but we've got no virus in WA, so you're fine. I just got a cold, right? I don't even have flu. I just got a cold. So, and I had a, like, a bit of a cough and, and so I was like, I'm not going to sing this morning, Lord. I'm going to save my voice for preaching. I'm not going to sing. But how can you not sing when you're in worship? I can't just like... I got that like... So anyway, I had to leave and have a drink <laughs> and settle my throat down. The characteristics of a new man is letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The Bible will bring an end to all confusion when, according to the Word of God, you divide it rightly. That means putting it into context and learning the truth of it. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to prepare yourself and prove to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. But beware, people of God, because it will throw up more questions than answers. I could write a song named it. Because of, our, because of our fallen mind. Now the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, at the last verse in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, it says this, but you have the mind of Christ. Okay? So why don't we know all things if we have the mind of Christ? Why are we still struggling with some things? Because there, when the Bible was written, there was no chapter and verse. So if you have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, he says, you've got the mind of Christ, but I couldn't speak to you as spiritual, but as carnal, because you are still babes in Christ. He says, you have the mind of Christ. Don't you know you have the mind of Christ? But, you know, there's some things I said to some, uh, some guys at Life Group on Friday. As we was talking a little bit along some of these lines. And I said, you know, there's some things you have that you don't know you have, so you can't use it because you don't know you got it. And uh, I remember a couple of months ago I was going through my wardrobe and I hadn't, and, uh, like I hadn't worn this jacket for a while, so I pulled this jacket out and put it on. I thought, ooh, fits nice. And I, oh, something in the pocket. And I looked in the pocket, 50 bucks. And I hadn't worn that jacket for maybe more than a year. I had it all the time. But I didn't know it was there. So I couldn't use it if I didn't know it was there. So you have the mind of Christ, but you don't use it because you don't really know you got it. Because... The mind of Christ will be activated only through the Word of God. And when you let the Word of God dwell in you richly, you start to see the Word of God will speak to you and you will start to know all things. Doesn't that, isn't that what 1 John 1.20-something says? You have the Holy Spirit and you know all things. Gee, it'd be easy to do the test at school, guys, wouldn't it? If I know all things... Well, the problem is you do. I tell my school kids all the time, when it comes to exam, when everyone has turned their paper and getting into it, bow your head. 
because you have someone with you who knows all things. He doesn't cover for your laziness. You can't just not study all year and just go, I'm going to get a pass. What you put in, the Holy Spirit will bring back to your memory so that you know. See, our mind is like it is because of this world or the sinfulness of this world and it shaped our thinking to a lie. And that's why I said to you just now in Romans 12 too, it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And let the, let the water of the word wash you. See, the blood of Jesus washes us clean from sin. Once and forever. Once and forever, Misha. Forever, that's right. The blood of Jesus. The water of the word washes us every day. Every day. We should pick this book up and we should read the scripture and let God speak to us and wash over us on a daily basis. Then we will start to know what the mind of God is. John 17, 17, it says, let me turn there, is to sanctify us and set us apart. This is Jesus' prayer for you. He said, sanctify them by your truth. That word sanctify means, simply means to set apart. Set them, see, if we don't know the truth of the word of God, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. It's the word of God that's going to set us apart from this world for Jesus. We're to be set apart from the ways of this world, which takes me to the only way to do that is to the third part of this. I said, believe it. I said, agree with it, but that's not the end. See, once we believe it, it opens the door to salvation. Once we believe it, and then we agree with it, we start to see great power, but then comes the final throw. We have to obey it. (laughs) See, it's not so hard to believe but then to agree with it. Hmm. But then obey it. But obey it willingly. See, when I was a kid, if mum said something, I believed it, I didn't agree with it, but I obeyed it. Why? You have a mum like mine? She'd whack you. <laughs> I believe what she said. I didn't agree with what she said, but I certainly obeyed what she said because of punishment. And people who live under the law, people who think that they have to keep the law to please God, they believe what God says. They don't agree with it, but they keep the law because they want to please God. But that's not how we please God. We please God by obedience. Amen. See, when you do something that you don't want to do, it's a real sacrifice, right? But King Saul went to battle with God's word. And the word of God came through Samuel the prophet. And Samuel told him to go do something. This is the word of the Lord. Go kill all the Amalekites. And King Saul said, okay. So he believed him. And He also agreed with him. He took his army, but he didn't obey. And when he came back, Saul pulled him up on his lack of obedience and he said, did you not know? Because Saul had kept some of the the animals, the Amalekites kept the king, and Samuel said, what are you doing with these things? You didn't obey the word of God. And Saul had an excuse like we always have an excuse. Amen? But it was... And he said, these are for the sacrifice. I kept these animals for the sacrifice. And that most famous scripture, 
where the prophet Samuel said to him, did you not know that obedience is better than sacrifice? All God wanted you to do was obey him. This morning concept, you know, what, what does God want to, to uh, know you more clearly? I've never known anyone play a, a, a scene from a rock concert in communion before. Where are you, Con? You nearly had me, like, worried. <laughs> but when you said the song, I knew, it, I knew the words. But in, in the book of Micah, the people had the same question. What do, what do you want us to do? Just tell us what to do, God, and we will obey you. You know, do you want... We'll give you rivers of, of oil and and thousands of sheep for sacrifice, and we'll do this and we'll do that. And, but it was all a sacrifice to God. And God says through the prophet Micah, did you not know that God doesn't want sacrifice? He just wants you to love mercy, to do justly, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. So we're called only to obey the word, not to rewrite it, not to add to it, not to take away from it, just simply to obey it. You'll be glad to know that I'm just off page one of ten of my notes. <laughs> it's okay, I've covered all the other pages already. The word... When you believe it, agree with it, and obey it, the Word of God will work perfectly in your life. It will. It will do its perfect work. The Bible says patience will have its perfect work. The Word of God will have its perfect work in you. When you not only believe it and agree with it, but obey it, the Word will bring the change we all desire. Who, who really needs to change some things in their life? The Bible will bring the change you need. There's a, an amazing story. This is the second part of your homework this afternoon. Nehemiah chapter 8 and 9. Go read that. Uh, the Word of God is found. The Word of God was lost. And uh, in, in here we see in the book of Nehemiah the story of Ezra the priest. And, and the, the Word of God, the scrolls, the Word of God is found again. And so the people said to Ezra the priest, come and, and, and read us the word of God. Read us the word of God. Because it had been lost for so long that people didn't know what it was. And I think sometimes your Bible's at home, but it's lost. I didn't put it somewhere. I remember I had it at Easter. <laughs> Go find it and read it. And Ezra, the priest, he, he, he built a wooden pulpit. That's the first pulpit in the Bible. And, um, and the people stood in the square. And they stood. And I tell you, you think, I preached long? This guy preached all day. And they stood to hear the word of God all day. 21st century church. Hallelujah. And he read them the word of God. And the Bible says it brought them to their knees and they repented. Why? Because they believed it. They agreed with it and they obeyed it. It brought them to their knees to a place of repentance and things started to change for Israel at that time. And the Bible says in, chap in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and is able to divide soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the intents and the thoughts of a man's heart. The Word of God is going to get down on the inside of you and is going to start to bring the change you require. You think you're out there trying to change your life when you could change it by the Word of God. You want a change in your marriage? Do it by the Word of God. You want a change in your relationship with your children? Do it by the Word of God. You want a change in your church? Do it by the Word of God. Don't come in telling me what to do and not what to do and we should do this and we should do that. If you have a good idea, pray. 
pray. And then come and tell me, because I'm going to tell you to do it. Because normally you say, this would be great if we could do this, Pastor. I go, go for it. No, I don't want to do it. You do it. And so the Bible says that the word of God is a sword. And take the helmet of salvation. Amen. And the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth. And, and gird yourself. Wear the shoes of peace, the Bible says. And, and take the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, which is the... Word of God. I say we fight. This how Jesus fought in the wilderness with the devil. That's how he fought. The word of God. I'm jumping pages, right? You'll be pleased to know. The word of God is the most attacked part of your Christian life. Do you know that? The word of God and prayer. Two things. But the word of God is the most attacked part of your Christian life because the enemy wants to keep you ignorant of the word of God. See, once you give your life to Jesus, genuinely give your life to Jesus, receive his forgiveness, become a child of God. The Bible says to all who believed, he gave the right to become the children of God. The devil doesn't have a say in your salvation. Okay, But if he can keep you out of the word of God, he has hamstrung you. And he has rendered you faithless. Let me say that word. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, we all have faith, people of God. How come he has more to me? Because it has grown. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. You should know that verse. Because in the word of God lies every answer to every problem. In the word of God lies your future and your hope. In the word of God lies your calling and your destiny, your encouragement and your enthusiasm. In it lies life abundant. It's in the Word of God. The Word of God is what keeps your spiritual heart pumping. It's what drags that old body out of bed in the mornings to say, praise you Jesus another day. It's the Word of God that does this. I want to read you a couple of scriptures to finish with this morning. Job said this. Old Job. Poor old Job. The one who went through everything. He said, I have not departed from the words of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Jesus said it like this. When the devil said, turn these stones into bread if you're hungry, he said, get away from me, Satan. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. King David said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. Hallelujah. Jeremiah said this, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back and I could not. That's every preacher's verse. The word of God was in my heart and I couldn't hold it back. Mary said this. This is Jesus' mother, Mary. Let it be done to me according to your word. When the angel told Mary that she was going to be uh, pregnant, have a baby. And she said, I've never known a man. And he said, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And you will conceive a son. And she said, let it be done unto me according to your word. The centurion said to Jesus, only speak the word and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus' response was, I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. Amen. 
Jesus has spoken his word to us and he's put it in this book. He's translated it into every language, put a leather cover around it, and you can buy it for about an hour or two's work wages. Did you know when this book was translated a long time ago, it would cost someone a year's wages to have this book? But Kurong has got shelves and shelves and shelves full of them. And we get so much like this. I went there a couple of months ago to look for a new Bible because mine's fallen to bits. Pages coming out. And they're not the ones I don't like. They're the ones I do like. <laughs> and I stood in Kurong for an hour looking at thousands of Bibles. And I couldn't find one I liked. Hey, dumb. How crazy is that? We have little excuse for not knowing this word, the word of truth. We need not be ignorant of God's way, our way, or even the devil's way. Because the truth is in here. We need the word of God, not in a book, but in our bones. Like, it, like David said, in his heart, Jeremiah said, in his bones. We need it on the inside. Because there might come a day, people of God, some of you younger people, listen to me. You older people, you may be gone. There may be a day coming when you won't even be allowed to have one of these. There's places in the world where you're not allowed to have one of these. If it's not in here, what are you going to do? If you don't know it, what are you going to do?